Today I'm going to talk about laser cooling. Laser cooling seems to be a contradiction in terms it, because I remember seeing James Bond splayed out on a table and a big laser coming along and apparently chopping him in half or threatening him to. And that's the image that most people have of a laser. You shine it on yourself, heat goes into you and maybe does you damage. Now, you can cool a gas of atoms, a gas of sodium atoms or rubidium atoms, from very high temperatures down to temperatures less than a millionth of a degree Kelvin absolute. And the guys downstairs, Peter Kroger et al, just under my feet, have laser beams running along there that can do this. So this is an optical table in um, one of our laser cooling labs. We call uh, lithium here. Gases of atoms consist of particles which are whizzing around, running this way and that way, and going, oh, I can't do this. And some are going slowly because they're old like me, and others are going really fast. And there's a whole collection of these all over the place. For laser cooling, obviously, what you need is a laser, or actually several lasers, but not so many. So this is one of them. This is a commercial device. It produces about a watt of laser light in this uh, nice red color that you see everywhere. This motion, this jiggling around motion of atoms, is what we call heat in a gas. It is the kinetic energy, the energy of motion of these particles whizzing around that corresponds to the heat and gives them a temperature. So if you had a gas of atoms, say let us take our, uh, sodium atoms or rubidium atoms and put them in a container, to cool them, we've got to get rid of all this jiggly motion, jiggling around in every single direction. I'm doing this just to wind you up, Brady, because you can't follow me. All right, now then, you send in a, a laser beam to this atom. Now, the laser beam is rather like a sound wave. And if I'm running towards this sound wave, the frequency goes up, as you hear when ambulances or trains go past and they're, they're going dee da dee da and it changes frequency. So if you're running towards it, you get a higher frequency mirrors here that, that are only used to steer the beam along different paths. Sometimes we need to split up a beam into several different paths. Then we have these little cubes here. There's one thing about atoms, which is different from me, is that atoms can only hear at one frequency or absorb light at one frequency. It's as though I've only got ears which work at one frequency. And I can, if I hear that frequency, then I'll be affected by it. So if I'm running towards a laser beam or a sound wave, I will only hear it if I actually match the frequency as I hear it. To get everything here and to buy the equipment and so on takes a few months, of course. But uh, to actually, once you have everything in place and to set it on the table, it's a question of a week, maybe, for an experienced person. So in our experiment, we set up a laser beam, which is equivalent to emitting a sound wave. And if I'm running towards it, I will only hear that sound if I'm running at a particular speed, which matches the speed which it's given out when it's been Doppler shifted. If I'm running away, I won't hear it because I'm hear sound wave which is shifted away from it. If I'm running upwards or down, I can't run upwards or forwards or backwards, I will be completely unaffected by it. So these atoms, if they move towards the laser beam, if they exactly match the frequency when it's Doppler shifted that's emitted by this, then they will absorb a photon. They'll absorb a photon, go to an excited state, and there will be a juddering motion. It's though a photon comes in and baffs me because I get a slight recoil, a momentum change, as this particle of light comes and hits me. So I slow down a little bit. I don't feel that I want to move so fast. And that means that if I keep the same frequency there, it will go straight through me because I'm off the right frequency. So what I have to do is change the frequency of the laser bit by bit by bit. You all, you see all of this in red, and the, the, this red color is 600, 671 nanometers in wavelength. Um, and you can imagine that, that you need not only the 671 nanometers, but also 671.0005 or something like that. So each time a photon comes and baffs me, I slow down a bit, then I change the frequency. Another photon comes in and baffs me, I slow down a bit, I change the frequency and it hits me, it hits me again. And it's as though I'm wading through treacle. They call it optical molasses because this is light coming out and it's acting like treacle or molasses as the Americans say. So I slow down and after 
10,000 of these baths into my side, I've slowed down so much that I'm hardly moving that way at all, and I've lost all speed in that direction. Okay, so once we've prepared all this light in the way we want, we actually have these two, these three components here, which are um, in coupling devices to put the light from these mirrors into optical fibers, and those fibers you see here, these blue things, and they actually transport the light all the way over to this other table so that we can treat our laser system and our laser cooling separately. That just dealing with things moving that way. In reality, they're going to be moving up and down. They're going to be moving this way or that way. So we set up lasers in this direction, coming in, coming in, lasers this way and this way coming in. So in this central region there is a whole, com a whole lot of photons coming in all directions and it slows down all the components of the velocity of the particles. All the jiggly motion in every single direction gets slowed down and they all grind to a halt. We shine laser beams that come from the other table through these fibers, here these fiber ends, so out of the, the light comes out of these fibers in, in, in these uh, locations here. So we have this direction, this direction, and then from the bottom. So we have three orthogonal directions from which the light comes, here, here, and here. And then we have mirrors that simply retroreflect the, the light beams into themselves. So basically we have pairs of beams. For example, the one from the bottom gets reflected by this mirror from the top. And then they, the light beams meet, and they, we have to adjust these things, and that's what these little screws are for. We can fine-tune these laser beams to exactly meet each other in the middle of this uh, vacuum chamber. And so instead of having things zapping around at great speed, there are old men crawling around as though they can hardly move at all. And that means that if they're hardly moving, their heat is reduced enormously, they've lost a huge amount of energy, and they're coming to a very low temperature. And you can get down to temperatures which are much, much smaller than anything you can imagine down to a millionth of a degree Kelvin, just measured from the distribution of speeds that these gas atoms have. The big advantage is once the atoms don't move anymore, and that is basically what cooling means, you, you stop all or essentially all of the motion of the, of the atoms, you can control them much better. So it's really like if you want to study animals, you put them in a cage and you, you, you watch them very carefully, and that we can do here with our with our atoms. We bring them essentially to zero temperature, we slow them down so that we can trap them in, in traps, so we can use magnetic fields, again laser light of slightly different type, or electric fields, and we can confine them to, to a very small room, and then we can, we can study them, sometimes even one by one, and sometimes we want to look at the collective behavior of all these gases when they, for example, form the famous Bose-Einstein uh, condensates. Well, the original point is that there was a prediction made by Bose and Einstein way back in the 20s saying that if you got gas atoms of things like sodium or rubidium, because they're a particular type of particle, they could all go in the same quantum mechanical state. And that's the thing which people subsequently have been able to do because of the development of this technique of laser cooling. What's that called? That's called Bose-Einstein condensation. It's as though you're making a funny sort of rain that the particles are all dripping out into a single quantum state and you're getting a new state of matter. So physicists love this because it's pushing the boundaries of physics into regions which haven't been explored before. And as soon as you get to that stage, you begin to be think that nature is whispering to you some deep and strange truth. Besides, it's, if you get to the stage where you actually discover something before anybody else, it is the second most enjoyable thing that I know.